By the 1930s, the Soviet Union had a well-established film studio system. The largest of these was located in Moscow and, after several name changes, settled on Mosfilm in 1935. For many years, its films began with a title screen featuring a statue of a man and a woman holding a hammer and a sickle. Another studio in Moscow was created to make movies for children. Originally known as Soyuz Dead Film, it was later renamed to Gorky Studio after a famous socialist writer. A third studio, Lenfilm in Leningrad, made over a thousand films in the northern capital, prefacing them with a title card featuring the bronze horseman statue. Elsewhere, many films were made at Kiev Studio, later renamed to Dovzhenko Studio, and at Odessa Studio by the Black Sea. Yalta Studio in Crimea was particularly suitable for films requiring a warm climate and a mountainous landscape. Additionally, the capital city of each Soviet Republic had its own film studio, often producing pictures in respective local languages. With the ability to create films with sound, the Soviet film industry did not hesitate to use the new technology to full advantage. The 1930s introduced the Soviet people to the genre of musical comedy. These films are notable for plentiful musical numbers, elaborate sets, and a very simple romantic plot. The lead characters have little to worry about other than a minor misunderstanding with their beloved, which is inevitably overcome by the happy ending. Perhaps more interesting are the various undertones in these comedies, aimed at glorifying the Soviet way of life and ridiculing its opponents. Grigory Alexandrov, a close colleague of Sergei Eisenstein, spent a lot of time overseas studying the art of filmmaking. While Eisenstein specialized in historical dramas, Alexandrov used the experience gained in Hollywood to produce the first Soviet musical comedy. Jolly Fellows is an over-the-top collection of musical skits loosely connected by a thin plot. Kostya, a shepherd, is mistaken for a famous conductor at a party and then again during a concert. After his unorthodox performance, he's invited to join a rowdy jazz orchestra. The real star of the film, however, is that of Kostya's love interest a hard-working housemaid named Anutka. For Alexandrov's wife, Lyubov Arlova, the role of Anutka was a breakout success. By the end of the film, the Cinderella-like Anutka transformed into a soprano singing superstar and charmed the audience with her smile. After certain party officials complained that Jolly Fellows did not contain an ideological message, Alexandrov addressed their concerns in his next picture. Circus stars Lyubov Arlova as Marian Dixon, an American circus performer likely inspired by the films of Marlene Dietrich. Marian tours the Soviet Union with her secret black child and an abusive manager. Meanwhile, a Soviet stuntman is tasked with designing a copy of Marion's human cannonball number, one which would be better than the American version in every way. Inevitably, the two artists fall in love and Marion stays in the Soviet Union where she can raise her child in peace. The film's message is emphasized in the famous patriotic tune heard during the finale, The Song of the Motherland.
In Alexandrov's Volga Volga, a small town full of musicians is eager to participate in a talent competition in Moscow. Alexei, an accountant, sails to the capital on a rickety river boat along with the symphonic orchestra he manages. His girlfriend, male woman Dunya, and her folk music band hitch a ride on a sailboat hoping to beat Alexei to the competition. As they race sailing down the famous titular river, they must overcome the perils of riverboat navigation. They are not helped in the matter by the town's clueless bureaucrat Bovalov, played by a silent film veteran Igor Ilyinsky. The unsophisticated plot is mainly there to cue the film's many songs, as in Jolly Fellows, Circus and many other musicals of the 1930s, Isaac Dunayevsky composed the music for the film, while poet Vasily Lebedev Kumach wrote the lyrics. In contrast to Alexandrov's films about musicians and performers, director Ivan Piryev made musicals with proletarian themes, featuring everyday workers and farmers. The main character of his tractor drivers is Mariana, a successful forewoman of a tractor brigade, played by Marina Ladinina, Piryev's wife. Being very popular with her male colleagues, Mariana makes a deal with a friend who will pretend to be her fiancé, so that she would be left alone. The plan backfires when Mariana falls in love with a talented newcomer, a tank driver named Clem. While many films of the 1930s included a subtle militarist message, Tractor Drivers is more overt as the characters find a broken German helmet buried in the soil and imagine their tractors as tanks on the battlefield. Perhaps the greatest legacy of the film was its song, The Three Tankmen, still performed to this day. Periyev's musical They Met in Moscow again stars Ladinina, this time as a pig farmer named Glasha. To learn more about animal care, she travels to a large farming exhibition in Moscow, where she meets Musaib, a Dagestani shepherd. United by their love for animals, they agree to meet again a year later, but a series of misunderstandings creates a rift between them. Musaib arrives in Glasha's town just as she is about to marry a different man for an unsurprisingly happy ending. Even in a cheerful musical, the characters are cautious that their country may soon find itself in a vicious struggle. A population prepared for war would also have to be physically fit. In The Goalkeeper, Anton, a fruit transporter, suddenly finds himself recruited in a football war between two engineering bureaus. The winning team has to take on the fictional Black Oxen, the best team of the West. By the mid-1930s, football was a very popular sport in the USSR and several famous Soviet footballers played background roles in the film. The patriotic message is further reinforced in the film's theme song, Temper Yourself Like Steel. The might of the Soviet airplanes is on display in The Pilots. Galia, a promising aviatrix, is fond of Sergei, a daredevil test pilot. As she learns from mistakes in piloting school, Galia subverts expectations and shifts her attention to Rogachev, an older, reserved engineer, knowing that the two of them cannot be together. 
The plot of the film doesn't have anything to do with the military, and yet, indirectly, it absolutely does. Alexander Ptushko was a pioneer of stop-motion animation and film compositing techniques. After creating many animated shorts, he combined his methods in a feature-length film, The New Gulliver. In the Soviet retelling of a Jonathan Swift classic, Petya, a young Soviet boy, dreams that he was transported to the land of the Lilliputians. Captured by the tiny people, Petya learns that the land is ruled by a stupid king, a cruel chief of police, and ugly aristocrats, while the workers slave away in depressing industrial dungeons. Among Ptushko's particularly impressive tricks was a live-action actor sharing the screen with stop-motion miniatures. Ptushko refined his techniques further for his next film, the Golden Key is based on a popular children's book, itself a very loose adaptation of The Adventures of Pinocchio. Buratino, Pinocchio's Soviet counterpart, is a wooden puppet crafted by a poor carpenter. During his journey, Buratino is pursued by an evil puppeteer, while two criminals, a cat and a fox, plan to cheat him out of money. In addition to previous innovations, Ptushko made great use of forced perspective. By carefully placing actors and decorations in foreground and background, actors playing puppets appear tiny next to full-size humans in the same seamless shot. Vasily Zhuravlov's Cosmic Voyage used innovative animation similar to Ptushko's works in a science fiction setting. In a futuristic version of the USSR, a scientist builds a spacecraft with the goal of landing on the moon. He takes an assistant along for the trip, and they discover a boy who snuck on board. The trio have a rough landing on the lunar surface and must overcome a number of issues before they can return. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the father of Soviet rocket science, worked as a consultant on the film and insisted on a number of details he considered to be scientifically accurate, including an early depiction of microgravity. The second half of the 1930s saw an abundance of films for children. The works of Jules Verne enjoyed a great popularity in the USSR, and so did films based on his writings. The Children of Captain Grant is an adventure film based on a novel of the same name. A distress message in a bottle is found by the crew of a Scottish ship from a shipwrecked Captain Grant. Captain's children plead for help, and the ship sets out on a rescue mission, essentially circumnavigating the southern hemisphere and exploring a number of exotic locales. The exciting journey is underlined by dramatic musical score composed by Isaac Dunayevsky. The Soviet film industry employed plenty of women alongside their male colleagues, but women directors were rather rare. Tatiana Lukashevich was one of the first to prove otherwise and made herself known with The Foundling. This charming comedy starred the five-year-old Veronika Lebedeva as Natasha, a child lost on the streets of Moscow. As she finds her way home, she meets a bachelor geologist, a strange woman, and a group of children. <laughs> A car chase serves as a nostalgic tour of pre-war Moscow. The young Veronica proved difficult to work with, and the foundling ended up being her only film role. However, it launched the film careers of two talented actresses, Rina Zelonaya and Faina Ranevskaya. 
Timur and his team is the name of a book and a film released simultaneously, which became instant classics. Zhenya, a young teenage girl, visits her relatives in a village and comes across a secret society of children. The society is led by the mysterious Timur, who tasks children to stealthily help the elderly, people in need and war veterans. Zhenya joins Timur's team, but when her army father suddenly visits a nearby town and Zhenya cannot make the rendezvous in time, it's up to Timur to help them meet. The film was a tremendous success, creating a volunteer movement in its wake, the Timurites, with children around the USSR striving to imitate the film's characters. Alexander Rowe dedicated his entire career, spanning five decades, to making fantasy films, often basing them on Russian folk tales. Wish Upon a Pike is Rowe's first work, a film about Yemelia, a young man who spares the life of a magic, wish-granting fish. A Tsar promises his daughter's hand to anyone who can make her laugh, and a number of volunteers attempt the task and fail. Only Yemelia is able to entertain the princess, much to the displeasure of the Tsar. The film also began a long-time collaboration between Ro and actor Georgi Milar, who played a variety of unusual characters in most of Ro's works. In Ro's Vasilisa the Beautiful, Ivan and his two brothers must shoot arrows to find their future brides. Ivan's arrow lands in a pond, and he brings home a frog. The frog turns out to be a beautiful young woman with a curse placed on her. To break the spell, Ivan must battle with the fearsome Gorinich the Serpent and his minion, Baba Yaga. To immerse viewers in the fantasy world, Ro made use of large sets, background matte paintings, and detailed animated monsters. After Nikolai Ek directed Road to Life, the first Soviet film with sound, he experimented with color cinematography. In 1936, he released The Nightingale, the first Soviet color film, and a bit later, Sorochin's Affair, another color feature. These color films used an early technology called BIPAC photography, in which images were recorded on two rolls of film at the same time one recording the shades of red, and the other capturing teal. Bipac film was not capable of recording true colors, producing an unnatural palette, and color cinema in the 1930s USSR remained an experimental venture. Nevertheless, Alexander Rowe used the technology in a fantasy film, where surreal color shades did not seem out of place. In The Humbacked Horse, the young Ivanushka is tasked to retrieve a princess so that a greedy old Tsar can marry her. He is assisted in his travels by Konyok Gorbunok, a magical miniature talking horse. Ivanushka searches the entire world for the princess, flying up to the moon and traveling to the bottom of the sea. Naturally, the princess has no intention of marrying the Tsar and favors her savior instead. While Stalin's favorite actors thrived on the silver screen, the end of the decade left the country in a precarious position. The Soviet Union, now a major power, found itself in the middle of world politics during a time of conflict. In 1939, the USSR protected its land assets in the East from Japan and aggressively expanded its western borders into Poland and Finland. Internally, the country was a paranoid police state. Stalin, growing ever impatient with others throughout the decade, implemented a massive purge of political opponents, senior army officers, intellectuals, ethnic minorities, and wealthy peasants. However, very soon Stalin would find himself needing every man and woman for the defense of the motherland. In 